Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthy Sleep and Movement for Everybody. Uh, my name is James Lawler. I am an adult with CF, and I will be moderating the session today, and we'll be introducing our other speakers in just a moment. Uh, but first, I'll bring up a couple of the housekeeping items. Uh, this session is being recorded today and will be available after the event on the CF Foundation YouTube channel. Uh, you'll get a notification by email when the session recordings are available. And uh, we will be taking audience questions today. So we hope that you will put your questions uh, in the Q&A box. You can find that on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, underneath where it says stage, you'll see that it says chat, polls, Q&A, um, and Mentimeter. Uh, so we'll be using uh, the Q&A and the Mentimeter today. Uh, if you experience any technology problems during the session, uh, visit the virtual help desk on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and we also want to remind everybody of our community guidelines, uh, which are, of course, to be kind, open-minded, and respectful of everyone else's opinions and experiences. And please don't ask for or give medical advice. So we won't be able to answer specific questions on individual uh, diagnoses or medical problems today. Uh, if you need any staff support at any time uh, or need to report a violation, uh, we encourage you to visit the help desk. Uh, later on in the session, we'll be using uh, the polling feature, like I mentioned, to get your input as part of our discussion. And you'll be able to see that uh, on the Mentimeter tab on the right side of your screen. Uh, so like I said earlier, our session today is healthy sleep and movement for everybody. So uh, we have a great discussion today that we focused on two incredibly important and sometimes challenging facts of not only living a healthy and happy life for everyone, but um, sometimes especially challenging uh, when that intersects with cystic fibrosis. So for the first part of the session today, we'll be focusing on sleep. So we will hear from Dr. Cindy Brown, who is the Adult CF Program Director at Indiana University. Uh, and she will start us off by discussing uh, some topics like what is good sleep and how does CF affect sleep. Uh, after that, uh, Dr. Andrew Braun will come on, who is the medical director at the University of Wisconsin Adult CF Program, and he'll be talking about uh, some common sleep disorders and their treatments. You'll also hear uh, from me uh, a little bit during uh, my part where I'll talk about my experiences uh, with sleep disorders like sleep apnea and insomnia. And then I'll moderate a Q&A with Cindy and Andrew. Uh, then for the second half of the session, we'll be focusing on the benefits and challenges of integrating healthy physical activity practice into your life and really finding a rhythm that works for you and your body while being responsive to things uh, like chronic pain and exacerbations. Uh, we'll be joined by uh, one of my longest time CF uh, friends, Cindy Baldwin, a fellow adult with CF, and physical therapist Dave Felton, who works with uh, many CF patients at West Virginia University. We'll hear from Dave some about common exercise myths and uh, from Cindy Baldwin about how movement fits into her life. And at the end, uh, Cindy will be leading the Q&A with Dave. Uh, so as for me, I have uh, had kind of sleep issues for really a lot of my adolescent and adult life. Uh, you know, it started out with, I was always a, uh, a pretty much a night owl. So I had a little bit of a later sleep phase, uh, would tend to go to bed later and wake up earlier than sometimes would, might be convenient. Uh, that is definitely still uh, something that goes on in my life. And uh, most of my adult life, I've also uh, struggled with some insomnia, especially uh, when I'm undergoing a lot of stress or um, if I have changes in my sleep environment, if I'm traveling, uh, sometimes if I have, you know, CF clinic appointments coming up that I don't realize that I'm thinking about in the back of my mind. Uh, and then about seven or eight years ago, uh, when I was in my late 20s, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea. So now I use a 
uh, BiPAP device when I sleep, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but really the punchline is um, I realized that I was having sleep difficulties kind of when I was having a lot of fatigue and didn't feel like I was sleeping very well, even though I was sleeping through the night. Uh, so one thing that that really always made me wonder about is um, if and how my sleep issues were related to having CF. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about how sleep and CF are related, uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Cindy Brown. Hello, thanks so much, James, for that uh, great introduction. I'm really excited to be back uh, with you guys at ResearchCon, and good evening and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, so I'm going to spend the first five to 10 minutes tonight talking a little bit um, about what is normal sleep and how sleep and CF interact. So I think it's really important to sort of ground what we know about sleep. First, the first question is, why do we sleep? If you think about it across the animal kingdom, all animals sleep and we are you know, part of that kingdom. And we will spend a third or more of our lives asleep when you think about sleep in early childhood. Um, it's really probably even longer than a third. So I think we all realize that sleep is important for restoring our energy levels, allowing our bodies to heal and repair. Um, and we know that we get, when we get poor quality sleep, we just don't feel like we can really do the same things day to day. Sleep is also important for uh, conserving energy. It allows our metabolism to go down so we don't need to, to basically hunt and gather those calories as we would if we continued to stay awake. What you may not know is that sleep is really important for growth and brain development. And the first uh, third of the night is when most of our growth hormone is secreted. And so in the absence of good quality sleep, that can affect um, how you're how a young child's brain grows and develop. And finally, it's really important to think about sleep and how we process and consolidate memories, both our cognitive memories as well as our emotional memories, and it helps to feed our creative processes. Next slide, please. So this diagram here is something called a hypnogram. And this would be ideal sleep. So this would be great sleep. You can see this is a, uh, a eight hour window. And if you were this individual, you would fall asleep really quickly, probably within the first 10 minutes of laying your head down. And you rapidly go through some of the lighter stages of sleep and hit that deep restorative slow wave sleep. And you can see that slow wave sleep clusters in the first half of the night. But about um, 90 minutes into your sleep cycle, you get your first rapid eye movement or REM sleep. That's usually when we think about having those vivid dreams for those of you who remember your dreams. And those REM cycles continue to occur about every 90 minutes throughout the course of the night, getting longer and longer as the night goes on. So if you had this quality of sleep, you would wake up after eight hours feeling refreshed, restored, and ready for your day. Next slide. This is bad sleep. So this say, this would be an individual who reported sort of poor quality, non-restorative sleep. Again, this is picturing an eight-hour window, but this person would be lucky to even get six hours of sleep. They are arousing frequently from sleep. They take longer to fall asleep. They're not getting the same amount of deep, restorative, slow wave and REM sleep, and they're having frequent changes, bouncing back and forth between wakefulness, uh, the lighter stages of sleep, and a person who experienced this type of sleep, despite being in bed for eight hours, is going to uh, feel groggy, have a hard time concentrating through the day, and maybe even uh, fall asleep unintentionally. Next slide, please. Why do people get bad sleep? I think there's lots of things we already know why you get bad sleep. If you are in a loud environment or sometimes even people can't sleep if they're outside their typical bed, if they're in a hotel room, they may get bad sleep. Or if they um, have poor, what we call poor sleep hygiene, they are drinking coffee like I just did, um, even at six o'clock at night, that caffeine isn't great for you. But there's a lot of other factors. We're gonna talk about sleep disorders with Dr. Braun later 
um, later this evening. There are other health conditions that can impact your sleep, including chronic pain, and anxiety and depression often cause disturbed sleep. I do want to mention medications. We're going to talk about Trikafta here in a second, but there are other CF medications that can affect sleep. So if you are experiencing poor quality sleep, I would have you uh, talk to your CF provider, CF pharmacist, to see if there are any medications that might be implicated. One common medication that could cause poor sleep quality is albuterol. It is a stimulant medication. So if you take that too close to bedtime, that could impact your ability to fall asleep readily. In addition, some of the antidepressants can impact um, the uh, ability to get REM sleep. So again, review your medication list with your, your CF care team if you're experiencing poor quality sleep. Next slide. So when thinking about Trikafta, I think this is the hot button issue that everybody really wants to know more information about. Obviously, this in the clinical trials, we were really focused on the, um, the initial safety and how well it affected lung function. But we all know in the intervening years since Trikafta has been approved, we are starting to see some side effects that we may not have anticipated. Last summer, the CF Foundation sponsored the Wellness in the Modulator Era survey, receiving more than 1,000 responses over a two-month period. Now, you did not have to be on a modulator to participate in this survey. And when they uh, drilled down to the 571 individuals who are continuing to take a modulator, you can see that about a quarter, 25% of individuals currently taking a modulator reported worse or much worse sleep quality compared to um, prior. On the flip side of that, 17% of people reported improved sleep quality. So I think we really need to understand a bit more about how Trikafta or other modulators may be affecting sleep quality. And if you look across sort of this whole scope of mental well-being, of which sleep is one part, we, we are seeing some other um, mental health related issues such as anxiety and depression that could also be affecting sleep quality. And we really want to spend the next few years um, in CF learning more about this. And I believe um, CJ Bathgate uh, in her plenary last night was talking a lot about mental health and there's still a lot we have to learn. Next slide, please. So this slide is a little busy and I'm gonna take a minute to ground us. So James mentioned being a night owl. And interestingly, there is some research that shows that people living with CF might have a tendency to have a delay in their circadian phase, which makes them more likely to be night owls. As we're learning about CF and the brain, um, it's important to think about CFTR that having a presence in areas where our circadian rhythm is set. And if you don't know what a circadian rhythm is, it's sort of like your 24-hour biologic clock. And CFTR, of course, has a function uh, on the um, olfactory senses, your sense of smell. And it also has some areas in the back of the eye that helps us know when it's light and dark and when it's time to sleep. So if we go to the bottom part of this graphic, you can see, and it's kind of small, at least on my screen, um, there are blue boxes and red triangles. And on the left-hand side, it's lung function. And on the right-hand side, it's normal, healthy volunteers. So this graphic, if you look at the blue boxes, it shows sleep latency in minutes, showing meaning how long did it take to fall asleep. So across the range of lung function, it took people living with CF longer to fall asleep than it did a normal healthy volunteer. And in the red triangles, it shows the total number of hours of sleep. And people with CF across, again, across the entire scope of lung function needed more sleep than normal healthy volunteers. Advance, please. Now on this side shows clock hour. You can see um, from about midnight all the way to about noon the next day. Again, if you're looking at those blue squares, it shows that when people are going to bed and people with CF across a wide range of lung function went to bed on average after midnight and later than normal healthy volunteers and they woke up later. Next slide, please. So to just sum up all those busy squares and triangles, people with CF take longer to fall asleep and sleep longer than healthy volunteers, regardless of lung function. 
and they tend to fall asleep later at night and wake up later in the day compared to normal healthy volunteers, regardless of lung function, sort of uh, indicating that people with CF may have a tendency to be more of a night owl phenomenon. Now with that, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Braun, and he's going to talk a little bit in more detail about specific sleep disorders. Great. Thanks for passing that baton, Cindy. So yes, I want to speak about some sleep disorders and some of the physiologic abnormalities that we can see during sleep, uh, particularly in people with CF. So the first one to bring up is having a nocturnal cough. Um, dealing with cough, dealing with frequent sputum production is something that can affect people, obviously during the day, but also at night. And I'm sure that there are many uh, people who are attending who have had difficulty sleeping when they're having an exacerbation or having a viral illness and what that does to their increase in cough. Now, in the pre-modulator era on the left, you can see a figure from uh, a research study in 2011 looking at how much people cough with CF. And they found during daytime hours on average 40 to 45 uh, cough episodes per hour. Um, obviously, that was decreased during sleep time, but um, in uh, people who are having exacerbations or viral illnesses, this can be increased. Now, on the right, we see uh, a recent uh, study that we um, described at the North American CF meeting in the fall um, that shows uh, the reduction in cough that we have seen uh, with Trikafta. So 57 individuals in the United States and the UK over a 12 week period of time did a 24 hour cough monitoring study. And we found a total of 20 to 30 coughs on average per day. And that is really um, very similar to uh, normal healthy individuals. So those who are eligible for Trikafta, and just as we've seen anecdotally in the clinic, have objectively uh, had a significant decrease in cough and, and that may have impacted uh, improvements in their sleep. Next slide. Uh, when we talk about sleep disorders, sleep disorder breathing or difficulty with respiration at night is one of the primary uh, disorders that we see in sleep clinic. Obstructive sleep apnea is the most common sleep disorder breathing. And essentially what's occurring at night are pauses in breathing due to airflow disruption. As we fall asleep, all of our muscles relax, and that includes the muscles in the back of the throat, that includes the tongue, and um, those combined together can lead to disruption of airflow and sometimes pauses in breathing. On the left figure, you can see normal airflow. There are um, blue arrows representing the airflow coming in through the nose to the back of the throat and down into the lungs. As we relax uh, during sleep and for those who are sleeping on their back, you can start developing a partial collapse. That's known as a hypopnea or shallow breathing event. And if that those muscles become very relaxed, often in the deepest phases of sleep, like the REM phase of sleep, you can have a full collapse. And that's when an apnea event occurs. Now, our brain and other senses within our body recognize that. So um, either you will have a micro awakening, which you may not remember, or you may uh, transition into a lighter phase of sleep where the tone returns to the airway and uh, a breathing uh, recommences. Um, however, um, that leads to a lot of physiologic challenges when you're having these cyclic pauses. You can have decrease in oxygen levels, increase in stress hormone release, increase in blood pressure, increase in glucose. Um, so over time, if that's left untreated, uh, people can develop significant comorbidities. So when I see a patient in clinic who maybe has gained some weight over time or is finding themselves to be more exhausted, we would uh, consider testing for sleep apnea. And um, typically that needs to be done in a sleep lab. Um, we now have home sleep testing uh, uh, equipment that's available. And in some patients with CF, that might be um, appropriate to look for sleep apnea. And if we do find sleep apnea and it is severe enough or impacting someone's quality of life, then the use of CPAP therapy is the gold standard therapy. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, patients use a, a small mask interface and are provided um, air pressure that then can stent open the airway in the back of the throat and allow for normal breathing. There are other uh, modes of a CPAP such as BiPAP or something called ASV that is sometimes also needed in people with CF. Next slide. So what do we know about sleep apnea in CF? So a recent study in 2021 revealed that um, children with CF compared to healthy controls do have increased uh, episodes of apnea and hypopnea. And 
Um, potentially, we may be under-recognizing um, mild forms of sleep apnea in children. And as I alluded to um, earlier, that weight gain in our adult population who's been starting on Trikafta may have also increased uh, the incidence of sleep apnea. This is a figure from the 2021 CF Foundation Patient Registry showing increases in body mass index in men and women with CF in the last two decades. And you can see there's been a, a significant uh, change in the slope of that line in 2020 and 2021 um, around the time that uh, patients started on Trikafta. So kind of our um, pretest probability uh, of uh, looking for sleep apnea in CF patients has definitely been increasing. Next slide. Uh, also, patients can develop problems with oxygen levels at night. So uh, this is a study from 2012 looking at cystic fibrosis patients who underwent sleep testing. And in those who were found to have desaturation events at night or having sustained drops in their oxygen levels of less than 88%, um, that this tended to correlate in patients who had more advanced forms of CF lung disease. So patients who had desaturation events were more likely to have FEV1s less than 40%. Here in this study, the average was 35%. And these patients also were more likely to have lower uh, resting oxygen levels during the day. So 92% compared to 96%. So in those who have developed more forms of advanced lung disease, we now have guidelines for uh, testing oxygen levels and looking for other comorbidities related to um, the decline in lung function. Next slide. Finally, I want to touch on another disorder of sleep uh, called restless leg syndrome or RLS. Um, this is something that we also see quite commonly in um, the CF clinic. And so this is a syndrome. It's not something that we diagnose from a sleep study, but is really based on history alone. Um, restless leg syndrome is a circadian uh, uh, disorder. It occurs primarily in the evening hours and early morning where patients develop uncomfortable sensations in their limbs, primarily in the legs, but can also be in the arms or other parts of the body. And there is this overwhelming urge to move. So as someone is falling asleep and, and, and or trying to fall asleep and resting in bed, these sensations tend to grow. And the only thing that improves that is, is movement. And so you may have heard of people pacing around their house at night because of these uncomfortable sensations. We do not believe that there is a direct um, genetic link with CF specifically, but there are familial forms of restless leg syndrome that can run through families and are driven by other genetic factors. On the right, there's a figure of a study that was performed in CF patients and healthy controls. And looking at uh, restless leg symptom scores, we found that in the general population, these were elevated beyond uh, that compared to uh, non-CF individuals. Another uh, factor that can impact restless leg syndrome is iron deficiency. And many people with CF related to intestinal malabsorption can develop iron deficiency over time. And uh, iron is very important in uh, neurotransmission and dopamine processing within the central nervous system. And so sometimes treating iron um, deficiency uh, can dramatically improve restless leg syndrome. And so if you're having those symptoms and discussing that with your CF care team, you may be recommended um, supplementation uh, with iron as a first uh, uh, choice or option. Um, and we also have other medications can, that can treat it as well. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on back to James to tell us a little bit more about his uh, sleep issues that he's been dealing with. Sure, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so let's see some of the things that I wanted to uh, share. You have, can see here that there is uh, a picture of me uh, with my uh, CPAP system. Uh, for me, you know, having CF, uh, it was kind of one more medical device uh, since I already had, uh, you know, the vest, nebulizers, and was used to things like that. But it was uh, definitely a little bit different. So uh, when I got diagnosed with sleep apnea, this really came about um, several years ago when I was working on you know, like getting my adult primary care set up and finding a primary care doctor. And, uh, you know, when talking about my family history and different things I was experiencing, um, I actually specifically asked him about sleep apnea. 
Um, and that's because I knew that my dad had sleep apnea. So I had seen him, you know, go to sleep studies and use a CPAP machine as well. And I knew that he and I shared a lot of those risk factors like, uh, you know, family history, having a, a larger neck and weight, uh, high blood pressure, things like that. Um, and I talked to my primary care doctor about some of the different uh, things I was experiencing, like that high blood pressure. Um, I had also noticed, you know, that I had a lot of fatigue and that sometimes I would wake in the middle of the night, uh, you know, feeling like I couldn't breathe or uh, with my heart racing, um, you know, in kind of a, a different way than I was used to with uh, CF, you know, breathing troubles, right? Uh, so he sent me to a sleep doctor. And what happened at the sleep doctor uh, was that, you know, they asked me a lot of questions, um, you know, had me rate kind of my fatigue and sleepiness in a couple different ways, things about, you know, asking how often I might fall asleep in various situations like uh, reading a book versus driving a car, right? And uh, then they sent me uh, for sleep testing. Uh, so the sleep test was definitely something that sounded a little bit intimidating at first, um, but really they uh, just, you know, kind of sent me to a very bland, you know, medical hotel room that looked exactly like any hotel room that you might uh, see from the Hampton Inn, uh, except, of course, full of miscellaneous medical equipment. So they, uh, you know, hook you up with all of the wires on your head and on your chest and uh, things to monitor uh, your breathing and your airflow and, you know, have cameras set up. And then they asked me to go to sleep like normal, as if it wasn't kind of the weirdest sleep situation you could possibly have. Uh, so that first time that I had a sleep study, I think I only slept about two hours, but it was enough to get a sleep apnea diagnosis. And um, for treatment, we first tried a, an oral appliance that would, you know, hold my uh, jaw open in a different way when I slept, but that wasn't quite strong enough for me. Uh, so we did some repeat testing, and that's when I started uh, using the CPAP and eventually the BiPAP, which is very similar, but has a, a different pressure setting for when I'm breathing in and breathing out. And uh, uh, so I continue to be seen by my sleep doctor uh, once or twice a year. And every several years, we might do another sleep test just to monitor uh, how I'm doing on the therapy. So I got to do that recently and actually got to experience the home sleep test uh, this time, uh, which was uh, a lot better than uh, the experience in the clinic. But I did end up back in the sleep clinic so that they could uh, kind of live adjust the settings um, on my CPAP therapy while I was sleeping. Great. Well, thanks for uh, sharing your story, uh, James. I guess uh, I wanted to reflect a little bit of how was your experience um, starting uh, using the CPAP, like within the first couple of nights? I I would say that um, getting adjusted to the mask can be difficult, and there's lots of different setting changes and types of masks that can be used. Yeah, so I remember being kind of worried about that at first because I thought especially, you know, having CF and having uh, – you know, issues with breathing as it was and being kind of sensitive to, you know, how well I was breathing, that it would be a difficult transition because I knew that I had heard, you know, some people that have difficulty with it that might find themselves, you know, taking the mask off in the middle of the night or not being able to sleep. But weirdly, uh, for me, it was not as bad as I expected. I got used to the mask pretty quickly. Um, and as you remember from the picture, I... I uh, use the full face mask that goes over my mouth and nose. And that's something um, that specifically I did since I know I have a lot of sinus issues along with CF. And I thought that for me, having the mask that went over both my nose and my mouth would help if I was experiencing some sinus congestion. So, you know, for me, I got used to it pretty quickly. And now I very much would not uh, enjoy trying to sleep without it. So now I think we can uh, get to some questions and answers. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with uh, one of the questions uh, from the Q&A tab uh, that's from, came in from Linda. 
And uh, her question was uh, really about melatonin dosing. So I, first I'm gonna back up and ask um, kind of about the supplement melatonin, what that is and why people use it. And then I'll uh, follow up with her more specific question. I'm happy to start with this one. So um, melatonin is something that we all naturally secrete every day. So there is a gland in the brain called the pineal gland, and we secrete that. And melatonin really is an important hormone in stabilizing our circadian cycle. Now, some people have a disruption of uh, that gland from trauma or some other type of medical illness, but sometimes people just do not secrete enough melatonin to reach a threshold that helps to stabilize their rhythm. So that's where sometimes we, we do recommend supplementation of melatonin to really help entrain it in more, um, uh, more uh, precisely someone's um, circadian cycle. Okay. And then uh, Linda's question specifically was, um, is there a reason to be concerned about the dosage in those melatonin supplements that can be found over the counter, um, specifically when it comes to the accuracy or uh, purity of the supplement? Yeah, and that's a, that, that is a great uh, question. Um, uh, melatonin is not FDA regulated, so um, it's not uh, something where you can, get, they need to guarantee uh, that the dose uh, is available or is, you know, that's labeled is in every single um, tablet. There actually is a medical form of melatonin that sometimes if really necessary, um, it can be prescribed. But in general, um, melatonin is safe. It does not interact with other types of uh, medications. Um, and I think probably every uh, sleep physician might have some uh, different patterns of the exact doses that they would recommend. Uh, but in general, it's a, a safe, um, product. Great. Uh, so this one I'll direct to Cindy. Uh, what are some of the benefits for uh, sleep care for when it comes to the whole family? Okay. I mean, I, I think for those of us who are parents or, or spouses or have a bed partner, I think we all know that if one person isn't sleeping bad, typically the whole family is sleeping poorly. If you have a, a bed partner who snores, then you don't sleep well. If you're like me and you have a child who didn't sleep through the night until she was five, there were days I wasn't sure that the, any of our family was gonna survive. Uh, luckily we all made it, she's 14 now. So I think part of the, part of, um, what I would say is if there is somebody experiences sleep disorder in the in the family, regardless of whether it's a child or an adult, it is important to to discuss it with the healthcare provider and try to see what you can do to improve sleep, whether it's setting, you know, setting some limits around sleep or some strict bedtime routines. A lot of times that's very helpful in children, addressing any sort of sleep disorder that may be present, like sleep apnea or restless legs, that also will improve. And I think if, if the person with a sleep disorder gets better sleep and the family gets better sleep, everybody, um, everybody gets along a little bit better. Great. Uh, so another question on uh, CPAP therapy was, um, are there concerns with using uh, sleep apnea devices when your lung capacity is diminished due to CF? Well, um, I think that might more speak to um, that it might, someone might not, 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 someone's sleep apnea might not be able to be treated by CPAP if they have have more diminished lung function. So uh, we spoke about the other settings sometimes that are available for CPAP and some people with more diminished lung capacity might also be having issues with carbon dioxide levels. And so sometimes BiPAP settings are needed. That stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. There's another setting known as adaptive servo ventilation that um, might need to be used to ensure that people with uh, diminished lung capacity can be getting the appropriate uh, amount of airflow at night. Um, it is um, relatively rare that CPAP would be um, disadvantageous or dangerous to someone. So I think, you know, sometimes people can be concerned, oh, maybe I've had a lung collapse before, so that's, which is also called a pneumothorax, that maybe using CPAP could be a risk factor for that. I think that's something that, you know, with your own 
pulmonology and sleep care team would, would need to be considered. But in general, um, finding an appropriate um, modality of, treat, uh, of use of a CPAP device based on a setting is something that's achievable in almost all situations. Right. When I started uh, using CPAP, I started with the continuous CPAP version where it just has one air pressure. And um, after using that for a few months, I ended up switching to the bi-level uh, BiPAP where there was a lower pressure for exhaling than there is for inhaling. And that for me was a lot more comfortable uh, for being able to get to sleep and get the uh, therapy that I needed. Uh, let's see, can you clarify a little bit on that difference between sleep apnea and the nighttime oxygen deprivation and the differences in how they're treated? Sure. So, um, you know, in, in CF, when I'm worried about someone having sleep disordered breathing, I usually do want to perform a full um, overnight sleep test to look to see if there are drops in the oxygen level. Are they related to apneic events or are they related to um, some other process? And um, as described, the sleep apnea condition, it's really a problem of airflow disruption in the upper um, airway, so in the back of the throat. Whereas people who are having desaturation events at night, you know, we do have to have concern that uh, there might have been a destru destruction of lung tissue over time, that their gas exchange of the ability to bring oxygen uh, into the body or release carbon dioxide uh, out of the body are impaired. And, and that really then speaks to what's the best setting to treat um, people, whether it's with uh, air pressure or with oxygen. That makes sense. Uh, I think we've got uh, time for one additional uh, sleep question. Uh, so one of the questions that came in during registration uh, was for those on CPAP or similar machines, are there any uh, tubeless options that exist or might be coming soon uh, for people that have feel like the machine is interrupting their sleep? I don't know of any tubeless um, devices at this point in time. I do, I think there are some novel modalities. Uh, so the Inspire device people talk about, it's sort of like a, I always say it's kind of like a pacemaker for the muscles in your sleep. That's an implanted device. It's not for everybody with sleep apnea, but it's certainly something that can be looked at in, in some subset of people. You mentioned having an oral appliance. Um, the, that is often a second choice, right? So that's, if it works for you, it doesn't work for everybody, but for people with mild to moderate sleep apnea, it can be quite effective. Um, and that can be an alternative device as well. Great. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, bring on Dave Felton uh, to ask kind of our transition uh, question about uh, sleep, which is, can you tell us a little bit about how exercise and sleep interact? Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. And uh, hi to everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm excited to share uh, this talk with you guys. Um, there are some definite associations with sleep and exercise in the literature. Uh, in the CF population specifically, one of the things that stands out the most is the effect of uh, sedentary behavior or not moving very much at all um, and how that affects sleep. It's been shown that the more that you move, the less sedentary you are on the day, the better sleep that you get and the more energy that you have. And that's one of the biggest associations for sure. Um, one of the reasons that we're talking about physical activity today is because people with CF are living longer, which is great. Um, and we all want to get the most out of our years, and research continues to show that physical activity is a key component of a healthy lifestyle, it sets us up for lifelong health, whether we have um, CF or not. So it's definitely an important topic. Next slide. Um, specific to people with cystic fibrosis, what the research has shown over the years is that we know that increased physical activity is, has all of these benefits that come with it. Um, improved fitness means that you're stronger, you have more energy, you're less tired when you do things. Improved airway clearance means um, more productive coughing and less lung infections. Uh, longer maintenance of lung function capacity. Improved BMI, which could be for someone who wants to lower your BMI. Uh, this could be done by exercise burning cal excess calories. If you're someone who wants to raise your BMI, exercise can be used in a different way. 
um, to help you uh, stimulate your appetite or even build muscle mass. Exercise and physical activity increase bone mineral density, um, improve mood, give a higher health-related quality of life, and research shows that people who are more physically active live longer with CF. So I'm guessing at this point, uh, just talking about physical activity and thinking about exercise, you probably have some thoughts and feelings and previous experiences that come with physical activity. It's likely that your care teams have talked with you about this. And so we want to take a minute to hear from you and see, just kind of get us your thoughts. We thought it'd be fun for you to just kind of say the first word that comes to mind when you think about exercise. And we have a little poll for you. If you click on Mentimeter in your chat box there next to the polls button, you'll have the option to type in a word and it'll pop up on our screen for us. And it kind of be fun to see what you guys think. And we can, we can talk about that for sure. And while those words are populating, um, I would like to introduce Cindy Baldwin. She is going to uh, be sharing her story with you shortly. And you want to say hi and maybe if you want yeah. to talk about these words as they come in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, my name is Cindy Baldwin. Um, I'm an adult with CF and I am really excited to be able to be part of this panel. Um, I, I see we already have some of these words that are populating as people enter them. Um, and I think that it's, it's worth noting that the words that people are submitting here are kind of all over the map. There's good words like commitment with family, um, involve everyone, stamina. There's also words like fatigue <laughs> and pain and time and work. And so um, I think that that for a lot of us, the idea of exercise can be really complicated. And I just want to acknowledge that to start with. Um, I want to tell a little bit about my story and why I am passionate about this topic and especially about treating this idea of physical activity with a nuanced approach. Um, so I obviously have CF. I was diagnosed as a baby, but I was pretty healthy and a very active and energetic kid until I was 16. And when I was 16, I got a very unusually severe case of mono um, that basically had me in bed for about a year. And after that, I developed um, fibromyalgia, persistent pain in all different regions of my body and chronic fatigue syndrome, which gave me a lot of post-exertional malaise, which means that when I would um, do any kind of physical activity or sometimes even mental activity, like having a conversation, it would really wipe me out sometimes for days. And so I, that obviously was a big struggle to go from having been this active, energetic teenager to somebody who could hardly have a phone call with a friend without it completely wiping me out for days afterward. And it was particularly hard to navigate with my CF care team because my CF care team knew the research that showed the connection between movement and exercise and a positive trend in FEV1. And so their focus was really for me to keep exercising and to keep getting the movement that they knew I needed to keep my lungs strong. But while I was dealing with all of these nebulous um, pain and fatigue and you know issues that we didn't have names for for a long time and didn't have any effective treatment for, a lot of the time when my care team would bring up exercise to me, it just started feeling really triggering and, and really um, frustrating and kind of almost invalidating of what I was going through. And my care team and I often had a hard time really seeing eye to eye and, and being able to find uh, healthy compromises and healthy ways to get me moving without triggering those issues. And this led not only to you know issues with that care team and what I felt comfortable sharing with them, but it also led to as I you know grew up and became an adult and moved to different CF centers in the country and, and started seeing different doctors, I really was reluctant to explain um, any of my pain or mobility challenges or fatigue issues with them because I felt like I, I didn't want them to just look at me as somebody who was not getting the right amount of exercise. Um, and I, you know, the older I got, the more I felt like I, I can deal with this. I have things figured out. I don't need to involve my care team in this issue. Um, when things got a little bit more complicated still, when a couple years ago as an adult, I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that is also genetic that is a lack of collagen in the body that can lead to um, really, it's really easy to injure joints and tissues. And so um, a lot of the time when I am active, I, I have to be careful. And sometimes 
I will find myself getting different joint injuries that um, will really affect my mobility. The pictures on my slide here, uh, the first one is from 2005 when I first got sick. I started having to use a wheelchair pretty much every time I left the house for anything significant um, because the pain and the fatigue was too intense for me to be able to walk. Um, the other pictures show how as an adult, I have um, been able to find ways to use accommodations to help me move around and interact with the world. Uh, I use a variety of mobility aids. I use canes and walking sticks. I also will sometimes use a wheelchair if I'm going to do something like take my daughter to the zoo or something that I know that I don't have the physical stamina to do. Um, and, and I've really found that as I have you found ways to support my body in the way that it needs, um, my ability to tolerate physical activity has increased. And as I've done that, I have also found that I am able to find ways to, um, to really enjoy that physical movement in my life and to find types of movement that are fun for me, that I can do with my daughter, that I can do with my husband, that I can do with friends. Um, for me, I really like going on little nature walks and hikes with my family and getting outside, being, you know, breathing the fresh air, things like that. I also enjoy uh, things that are a little gentler on my body while still providing positive benefits like yoga or Pilates. And so I have, I have really come kind of from somebody who was really resistant for a long time um, about any discussions about exercise to somebody who is passionate about the topic of movement and activity. Um, but I also feel like it's really important to, when we're having these discussions with our care teams and um, with other providers and even as patients with each other, to acknowledge that for a lot of us, especially as we age with cystic fibrosis, um, our bodies are complicated and the topic of exercise can be complicated. And sometimes we need to find unique and creative ways to get movement that are going to be healthy and supportive for our body and not harmful. Um, so I'd love to bring Dave back on and I'd, I'd like to ask Dave as a physical therapist, what kind of advice would you give to patients like me who may have had complicated experiences with exercise and might have misconceptions around exercising? Well, first of all, thanks, Cindy, for sharing your story. And thank you guys all for the words that you've put in here. These are great. Um, uh, the advice I would give is um, kind of what we're going to talk about next is just remembering that um, we're all individuals. So we are all going to approach physical activity differently and it's gonna look different for everybody and it really shouldn't look the same. And um, you definitely don't ever need to come from a place of guilt when you're thinking about physical activity, whether um, if you're not getting it enough. Um, the main thing is just remembering that um, you're gonna exercise and movement is gonna needs to be specific for you and you have help with your care team as well with that. One of the reasons that we wanted to talk about these words uh, and this word cloud and kind of have you guys um, speak to that a little bit was because the thoughts and beliefs that we have towards physical activity, we all know exercise is important, but uh, what, we, what we bring to exercise can affect kind of our, our willingness or our eagerness to, to get involved in uh, like in Cindy's story, sometimes um, we can have some real difficulties with exercise. So uh, we thought it might be useful to kind of talk about five um, beliefs or maybe myths about exercise that perhaps if clarified might open the door for a better relationship with physical activity. So we'll just give it a try. Um, the first one is this thought that I have to exercise to get physical activity. And this is kind of a, a myth, if you will, because um, exercise is, is actually just a subtype of physical activity. Um, physical activity is really just any um, bodily movement that uh, uses energy. Exercise is a subtype of that. So an example of physical activity might be um, cutting the grass, mowing the grass, shoveling snow, uh, dancing, playing a sport, going for a bike ride, um, or it could be exercising. Uh, an example of exercise would maybe be doing three sets of 10 jumping jacks and squats and sit-ups and push-ups, um, or going to the gym and getting on the machines that are there, uh, just as an example. 
the benefits that we talked about in the first slide were not specifically about doing exercise. They were about getting physical activity. So uh, exercise is just one of those ways. So if you're not someone who likes to exercise, there are still lots of good options for you. And ideally something that you enjoy, which is what brings us to our next, uh, our next belief, um, which is it's possible to think that um, getting physical, physical activity can't be enjoyable, especially if you haven't had good experiences or you don't feel like you have interests in exercising. Um, the reality here is that um, physical activity can be enjoyable, and really that's the key. <laughs> uh, studies show that even, um, studies show that um, we're much, uh, if we try to do exercise or physical activities that we don't enjoy, we're very unlikely to continue doing them. Even if we have really good willpower, it's not likely to stick. So the key is to find uh, physical activities that you enjoy and try to make more time for them in your life, or think about things that you really do enjoy doing and think about ways that maybe you can make that thing that you enjoy more physically active. Um, a lot of times I'll talk with patients who one of their common ways of being physically active is they'll take their dog for a walk and one, and they really enjoy that. And one small piece of advice that I will give them perhaps is take your dog for a walk jog where you walk for a little bit and then maybe you just jog with your dog for 30 seconds. And most dogs are probably going to really love that 30 seconds. So that can make it more fun too. Uh, number three, um, if I can't get the recommended amount of physical activity, I might as well not do any. And this one, I really understand. Um, you've probably heard, or you may have heard that we're all recommended to get at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity if we're adults and about 60 minutes if we're, if we're a kid. And that may seem, if, if that seems like difficult to do for you, um, the tendency is to say, well, I can't do what I'm supposed to do, so I'm just not going to try. And there's really great news for you in this. And that is that studies show that even small increases in physical activity habits can uh, improve health markers and functional capacity. It's sort of like a dose-related response. While that 30 to 60 minutes is really the ideal, anything that you do that moves closer to that is going to have benefits for you. And so it's really worth doing, which is really nice. Number four. Um, I'm failing at physical activity if I'm not doing what other people with CF are doing. This kind of plays into that guilt feeling that I know can be out there some, especially in today's world of social media with a lot of influencers. Um, there can be, you may see videos of someone who's with CF who's had really phenomenal body transformations or really changed their lifestyle, running marathons, um, doing really amazing, great physical things. And it may be tempting to think, you know, as with all social media, that, you know, that's what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm not doing that, so I'm failing. And that's, uh, thankfully, that's, that's not true. Um, movement is going to look the same for everybody. Uh, those achievements that people do, that can be really inspiring and that can be a good thing to see what people with CF can do. Um, but the reality is that um, if you're motivated to run a 5k or do a marathon, that's great. That's going to really help you with your fitness and be good for you. But if it's a big step for you to go for like a 15 minute walk three times a week and you do that, that's great for you. It's going to have health, health benefits for you. And it's an accomplishment that is worth pursuing and you're doing well if you're increasing your activity like that. So hopefully that helps a little bit. You might find that it's something that you can you can build on as well if you get started with something small. All right, number five, last one. Physical activity isn't an option for me because my body hurts when I try. And I did see there were some of the responses in the word cloud were pain. And so if this is you, um, I just want to say um, I feel for you. As someone who's dealt with some chronic pain myself in my life, I know that this can be really difficult. Um, but uh, the main thing I want you to take from this is that there is help for you, um, especially if you work with your team. And we'll talk about this on the next slide. But um, frequently, there is a way to treat your pain and find ways to move that can help you be active and that will work for you. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to that next slide. Um, we're going to talk a little just about some ways that you can partner with your team to help with your movement. Um, first, if pain is a barrier for you, you can talk with your um, your physician on your CF team or even your primary care doctor and ask for a physical therapy referral. Um, 
physical therapists are movement specialists and their expertise is diagnosing and treating causes of pain and movement difficulties. Um, and actually, Cindy, I think you have a little bit of personal experience that might um, help out here. Yeah, I love that you brought that up. Um, I agree so much with all of your points. And for me personally, I have found utilizing physical therapy to be a really crucial part of being able to move my body in healthy ways while supporting um, you know, both issues that CF might bring up and, and chronic pain and issues that having Ehlers-Danlos brings. Um, I have been, I've seen various physical therapists off and on since I was a teenager, both to help rehab specific injuries and to help strengthen my body so that I'm able to do things that I want to. And it's been really transformatively helpful for me. That's great. Um, if you are someone who has a, a physical therapist in your clinic, um, that's really great. Unfortunately, in the clinic setting, a lot of times it's difficult to, for the therapist to have enough time to really give you the time that you need to diagnose and treat your pain in that setting. And that's where a referral to a therapist back in your hometown where you are can be really helpful. Um, the second bullet port point says, ask for advice or resources to help you get started with or optimize your physical activity. If you have a physical therapist in your clinic, that's a great place to start but your clinic may also be able to point you um, to some resources that can help you as well. I'm sure they're gonna wanna be supportive of that. And another option is you can also um, talk about uh, with your team about potentially using exercise as an airway clearance technique, maybe as a way to either supplement what you're doing or even maybe even simplify as an option. So that's a good discussion you can have as well when you're partnering with your care team with physical activity. Next slide. So in closing, I'd like you all to just remember that you are unique, so you should move like you. Uh, what works for others may or may not work for you. So the best way to um, get moving is to just start where you are. Uh, it's helpful to think about what you're already doing. Um, if you're already taking some walks or already doing some exercise, that's great. You should celebrate that. You're doing something that's really positive and helpful for yourself. Um, it's helpful to think about what activities you enjoy, like you mentioned. Is there space that you can make in your life for more of that? Um, what activities make you feel better when you do them? That's really something that's helpful to think about, especially physical activities. What makes you feel better when you do them? And that can really help um, with the lasting habits with movement when you realize how it makes you feel better. Um, what time of day do you have the least and most amount of energy can be helpful to think about? What barriers do you face? If you have um, barriers to physical activity, that's going to make it hard to do physical activity. So it's helpful to think about ways that maybe you can get past those barriers. We mentioned pain as one, for example, maybe working with a physical therapist could remove that barrier for you. Um, what motivates you and what goals do you have? It can be really helpful to set goals for yourself. And if you are a goal setter, starting with a really small goal is really helpful, um, making a small increase. And then you can set yourself also a little bit more challenging goal as well. But the key in all this is to find a sustainable rhythm that works for you, thinking about the long term um, with physical activity and a healthy lifestyle. And hopefully this talk has sparked maybe some ideas to help you on the way. So thank you for listening. And I think we'll transition to maybe a time of questions. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Dave, for sharing all of this. I think that is such good information. And I know that, like I mentioned, I've found a lot of that advice really helpful in my own life. Um, so we have a question from the chat. If someone is looking for a physical therapist, does the provider need to have an understanding of CF? Okay. That's a great question. Uh, no, the physical therapist does not have to have a really thorough understanding of CF to treat your pain and give you a really good outcome. Um, it may be helpful to, and you probably should, uh, educate your, your therapist on some basics with CF, especially as it relates to the treatment plan that they're setting for. But as physical therapists, the training and expertise that they have in treating pain is going to help you, even though regardless of if CF may be causing the issue, it may or may not. It may be unrelated to your CF that they'll be able to treat. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, I will add also from my experience that the majority of physical therapists I've worked with have not had prior understanding of CF. 
Um, and many of them have not even had any contact with or, you know, connection to my CF team. But it's been really interesting because I feel like some of them have taught me about the effects that CF has on my body, even though they may not like actually understand the respiratory aspect and, you know, the things that we more commonly think of with CF. Um, th they've helped me understand, for instance, that, you know, I struggle to have proper posture because my chest muscles are really tight because breathing difficulties pull you forward and all, all sorts of like uh, body functionality stuff like that, that I have never even thought of. Also, lots of I've worked a lot on breathing techniques with physical therapists. And let me just tell you, I had no idea how far beyond the like make your stomach go out when you breathe technique breathing really goes it's it's a uh, yeah that's that's still a struggle for me um i also we have another question um what if what are some strategies for finding a physical therapist where should somebody start if they don't have a physical therapist on their team and they want to find a physical therapist to work with okay that's a great question um so two things one is convenience uh, you're going to probably realistically, you're going to be getting on Google and you're going to be Googling physical therapists in your area. You can ask family and friends. Um, what I would recommend is that you Google uh, a place that you've heard about, maybe that you feel like has a good reputation or a place that's convenient for you. Get a list and then call those places. And most likely you're going to be having uh, what we would call an orthopedic problem, a pro like a musculoskeletal problem, in which case there are specializations in physical therapy. And if you were to call and ask if the clinic has someone who is an orthopedic clinical specialist, um, and they do, and you saw that therapist, you can be pretty guaranteed that you're going to be working with someone who is really an expert in treating the kind of issues you're likely facing. Yeah, that's really helpful advice. I think I've found all of my physical therapists either sort of through random word of mouth or just through Google. Um, and I've, I'll also add that it's been helpful for me kind of at different points in my life to seek out physical therapists who work in different areas of expertise. Um, and sometimes when I feel like I've, you know, really learned a lot from one therapist, then working with another one who has a different specialty has been, been helpful and helped me learn more. Um, another question from Seth Jacobs is what's the difference between a good out of breath and a bad out of breath? Okay. That's a great question, Jake. Uh, Seth, sorry, Seth Jacobs. Um, so a, a good out of breath would be any, as soon as you're starting to get shorter breath, where it's difficult to talk in complete sentences, you started to get into the moderate intensity exercise zone is, which is where we want to be. And that's good. Um, really, you can take that all the way up really high in terms of shortness of breath. It really only becomes bad if you're having oxygen desaturation. Uh, where your oxygen percentage is dropping below 90%. If you have a pulse oximeter, if you're someone who has maybe a more advanced disease, for example, you would really want to be monitoring your oxygen saturations. Um, if you also have some asthma, bad shorter breath would be if you're starting to have your asthma symptoms where it's difficult to catch your breath. You feel like you're having some bronchoconstriction. Um, but if you, aside from those two things, you can get, you can get pretty shorter breath and it's not bad for you. You just may need to rest um, slow down a little bit, catch your breath before you go on. There's a lot of good evidence that shows that a type of exercise where you, you work pretty hard for a short period of time and then do lighter activity for a short period of time, it's called um, high intensity interval training, is really helpful form of physical activity um, that can help you kind of get some of that higher intensity, but then calm back down, let yourself catch your breath before you go back up. That's great. And I'm just going to throw in my question that kind of follows on Seth's because I feel like this is something that in my life with a history of chronic pain, I'm always trying to like figure out for myself, which is how do you tell the difference between like a good pain and a bad pain in terms of a lot of the time when we are exercising or especially like moving our body in a way that we have not been used to, like there is going to be some discomfort and pain along with that. How do you tell like, okay, this is good. Let me keep going versus this is my body telling me to stop. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, one way to think of it is on a number scale. Um, if you think zero to 10 pain where zero is no pain at all and 10 is the worst pain of your life. If you are having pain in like maybe a three or a four range and it's not getting worse than that, then that may be okay. If your pain is getting worse as you go and it's changing in intensity, then that's probably, that could be a sign that 
maybe um, the activity is maybe exacerbating something. Sometimes it's difficult to tell. So the intensity is one thing. Sometimes the other thing is just um, how you feel after the activity is over, maybe the next day or so. If it really flares you up, then you know, oh, that you learn from that experience and you know, say, oh, that was actually not a good pain. And you know to back off a little bit the next time when you feel that. Yeah, thanks. That's really helpful. That's something that it, like I have realized that because I have a 10 year old that's come up in parenting where she'll be like, but this thing hurts. And I'm like, well, sometimes it hurts. But, you know, how do you explain that? It's a yeah. tricky thing. It's um, tricky. We have another question from Linda Brown, which is what about heart rates? And I'm assuming she means what are good versus bad heart rates in exercising? OK, um, yeah, you can get really you can really get into it when you start looking at heart rates. Uh, there is a formula for how you can calculate your your ideal target heart rate for physical activity and a range that you would want to stay in. You can Google it pretty easily. It's usually it's 200. A common one is 220 minus your age, and that would be your maximum heart rate. And then you could multiply that by a percentage like 0.7, and that would give you 70 percent of your maximum heart rate. Um, and that would be, usually you would do a range between like 60 and, and 80% for moderate physical activity. And you could track that with your smartwatch, or if you're good at taking your pulse, you could keep an eye on that regard. Um, that is definitely one way to know how, uh, if you're in a good, a good zone for getting the type of benefits that you want from physical activity. Um, in terms of a heart rate that would be too high, um, for the most part, as long as you have a healthy heart, it's really difficult to exercise your heart too high because um, you're going to get tired and then you're going to want to slow down. But in general, the best the best range is, is usually between 60 and 80 percent for moderate to continuous activity. That's really helpful. Thanks. Um, OK, we are almost done. There's one more question in the chat that was directed at me which um, was how has the use of mobility aids allowed for healing? Um, and that's something that I kind of alluded to a little bit in my talk that I've used different kinds of mobility aids in different aspects of my life. Um, and I, I'm also gonna add that this is not necessarily, um, not all people with CF are going to need to use mobility aids. Uh, my need for them comes more from having fibromyalgia and Ehlers-Danlos. Um, but I have really found that um, when I am really able to use things that support my body, they allow my body to rest and to fully heal when I do get an injury, then I am much more able, much better able to exercise um, more meaningfully, I guess I would say. Uh, for a long time, I feel like I steered clear of using mobility aids because I worried that it would make me out of shape or it would, you know, uh, like I would lose muscle mass. Um, but what I found is that when I am trying to just push, in, you know, through things that my body is not actually capable of, then I never really heal. If I have an injury or if I have an illness, I, I never actually get over it. I'm always like functioning in a, at a subpar level. Whereas when I really allow my body to get the rest that it needs, um, whether that's through actually like sleeping or resting, taking time off if I'm sick or through using a wheelchair, if I have, if I'm having problems with my legs or feet or using, you know, a cane or a walking stick, if I am having other issues, um, then I am able to get to a much higher level of physical performance than I was previously because of that. Um, and I know, Dave, that we, you had mentioned in, in one of our discussions about this, that there was some research uh, about the role of rest in exercise. Do you want to speak to that for just a second? Oh, yeah. Um, so especially in extreme sports, like people who are doing Ironmans or running 150 mile races and things like that, uh, or CrossFit, uh, those competitions, some of the some of the the better athletes are really focusing now on the science of rest in those sports and learning that you can't just go, go, go all the time and work out, work out, work out. Your gains won't be as good as if you really have good quality rest and the right amount of rest in between your workouts. Yeah. I just thought I wanted to bring that up because I thought that was so interesting when you mentioned it, because that's certainly been true in my life, but I feel like that's something that's 
in the colloquial discussion about exercise and movement, not really talked about a whole lot. Um, anyway, I am, I just wanted to, as we start to wrap up this session, I wanted to thank all of our speakers for being here and especially to thank all of our attendees for joining, for your wonderful questions and comments. Um, and before we go, I'm gonna ask the attendees um, if you could please take some time to fill out the satisfaction question. It's under the poll tab on the right hand side of your screen, right next to the session chat. Uh, we'd love to know how you felt about today's conversation. There's also a lot of wonderful resources related to this discussion, including the slides from today in the resource document that's found on the reception page. Um, please go ahead and spend some time exploring the resources and download anything from that that you might want to keep. Next up on the agenda, we're going to have a 30 minute break and then we're going to have the closing keynote, which will begin at 815 p.m. Eastern time. Or if you are super excited and want to continue uh, learning and don't need a break, we're also offering virtual roundtables in the sessions tab that's on the left hand side of your screen. Um, these roundtables are going to be staffed with a representative who can take your questions and provide you with more information on foundation sponsored research projects and initiatives, including wellness resources available to the community. Um, attendees are encouraged to jump on screen and share your mic and video directly to interact with the representatives and other attendees in those roundtables. After the closing keynote, there's going to be an opportunity for small group discussions for the CF community. The topics included in these small group discussions are living longer with CF, CF-related diabetes, infections. Um, also, James will be co-moderating a small group discussion on sleep, and I will be co-moderating a small group discussion on movement and activity. So we hope to see you at one of those. And we thank you again so much for attending ResearchCon and bringing your wonderful energy, your knowledge, and your questions um, to our session today. Thanks so much.